Thank you, everyone. Welcome, everybody, to today's event. We are organizing the event by Corlet Netherlands, which is a nonprofit organization that connects data scientists with NGO organizations who help advance the social good. We have about 300 data scientists operating in the Netherlands and over 2,000 abroad volunteering worldwide. You can learn more about us by visiting the website corlet.nl or corlet.org. Uh, but without any further advertisements for Correlate, on today's event, we are talking about the power of collaboration and data. We are very excited to introduce our speakers this evening, joining us from CrowdFight, an NGO with a mission to promote the advancement of science, its contribution to society, and the well being of the scientists. As an NGO that started at the beginning of the COVID 19 pandemic and grew to over 45,000 volunteers in just two years, they know how impactful the power of collaboration is and what is needed in order to make it work on a global scale. Please join me in welcoming Alfonso Perez Escudero, co-founder at Crowdfight, Ana Moran from the core team at Crowdfight, and Alberto Pascual Garcia, board member at Crowdfight. As scientists in heart and soul, they are dedicated their lives to research and science, and with CrowdFight, they are aiming to change the way science collaboration works. This is an interactive session, so feel free to ask questions or raise your questions in the chat box, or ask your questions after the talks. There is plenty of time to ask questions and discuss ideas, so I would say engage in the conversation and enjoy the session. So without any ado, Alfonso, Anna, Alberto, welcome. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and please take it away. Thank you. So I will begin. I will share my screen. Wait. So you should be able to see my screen. Yep, I can see it. Um, nice. So as he said, we are a part of uh, um, CrowdFi. So I will start by presenting who we are, what we do. And then uh, Alfonso will continue talking about uh, more kind of our philosophy. And Alberto will be answering some of the questions if you have them in the chat. So to begin, I will tell you how we started. So in March of last year, um, uh, the lockdown uh, begin here in, in France because we are based, some of us as, are based in France. So the lockdown begin and uh, we are scientists that are not working in things related to COVID. But we, so we had to stay home um, and we still felt that we had to do something. We had a lot of expertise and we wanted it to, I, we wanted to help people. So uh, some days after the beginning of the lockdown, we launched um, a platform to put in contact researchers uh, with expert volunteers. So volunteers who have expertise in different areas that are not directly uh, related to COVID, but that could help. Um, at the beginning, we thought that this idea was going to fail and nothing was really going to happen. And we expected to close our website like two days after everything, but it blew up. And we had like thousands and thousands of volunteers that sign up in our in our platform. So how we work. Um, we have a website where you can choose either to join our community. Uh, so everyone can do that. Or you can make a request. So you are a researcher that needs help. You can go just make a request. You write what you need and we will help you. So imagine you're a researcher, you're looking for help. So you make your request, uh, you send it to us, and then there will be a coordinator that will get the, 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 the request. And then um, they will send it to our community of volunteers to try to find someone that uh, can help. So um, we have received hundreds of requests and um, we, for each request, we select the more suitable volunteers 
and put them in contact with the requester. Um, we found out that there are really thousands of people that are that want to give their time uh, just to help another scientist. We received different types of requests, um, going from people just asking for reagents to researchers asking for translations of, of surveys uh, to have them in different language. And like half of them ended, ended in long-term collaborations. So it started like a small task, but then it transformed into a long-term rela uh, relationship between um, both persons. So I wanted to show you so, just some example of the kind of requests uh, we had. Um, so some of the first requests we had was someone asking um, to compile a database and to update this database. So we put them in contact with three different volunteers and that team uh, updates the database and compiles it. Um, we also have uh, people asking for protocols. So in this case, we had, uh, we had a person that was able to write the protocol and send it. And we actually received more requests asking for the same protocol. So we put her in contact with even more people that were able to to work with that protocol. Um, so as we were talking like some months ago, we did a, a symposium to talk about the requests we received and to talk about some of our volunteers. So I have a video from one volunteer that is saying her experience with us. So I will play that video so you can, you can hear it from her. You should be able to hear it, if not, Tell me. <laughs> So last spring, I think like many people, uh, I found myself working from home for three months. While the life sciences... Uh, it's not very loud. Can you put the volume up? Closed, uh, to be made. Because I think it's getting through my mic. No, I can't. I see. So that's what I was trying. No, I, I think it's good enough. We can just give you the okay. Yeah, if you play it, it will be okay. Yeah. Yes, I think it's because it's going out of my computer and then into the mic, not directly to you, even if it should. I don't get why. I'd like to talk to you um, about my experience as a volunteer on CrowdFund Task 241E. So last spring, I think like many people, uh, I found myself working from home for three months, while the life sciences um, department at Bristol University was closed uh, to be made COVID secure so that we could return to work uh, last summer. Now, I'm a very practical molecular biologist. I've been a postdoc forever. Uh, and I primarily work in the lab. Um, so my boss, at the beginning of working from home, sent his research group this poster. Scientists without a lab, a researcher's guide to COVID-19, what to do while working from home, including obviously the usual tasks such as writing up one's lab book, reading papers, crunching data, and a number of other really useful tasks that myself and my colleagues got on with. But then one day on social media, um, a friend shared this page on Facebook, volunteer your time and skill. If you're a researcher not currently involved in COVID-19 research, you can help. And I thought, you know what? I'm sitting here at home, I'm a molecular biologist. This is something that I can do. So I, I sought permission from my boss, who very generously said that I could have all of the time that I needed to help out, which was great. So this is task 241E, as it landed on my email inbox. Um, I'll just summarise for you. 
volunteers were needed to do a literature search and summarize on the proofreading mechanism of coronavirus. And research ideas, including drug design, were also welcome. So coronaviruses are tricky. They can resist antiviral nucleosides by carefully proofreading during RNA synthesis and literally just snipping them out. So um, the research involved wanted to know more about that molecular mechanism in order to help him design um, better drugs to fight COVID-19. So the requester was Wai Long Ng, also known as Billy, uh, assistant professor at, uh, in chemical biology and drug discovery at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So he's a medical chemist designing small antiviral molecules and he wanted molecular biology advice. So I was not the only uh, volunteer. Uh, and in fact, what Billy decided to do, rather than just asking one scientist to put together uh, a review into proofreading, uh, he decided to ask a team of us, coordinated by me, and make it a really collaborative effort. So, Billy was joined by his very talented research assistant, Kavija, in Hong Kong. And then we were also joined by Palma Roshi's lab in France, her PhD student, Panam Pari, and from Vietnam, uh, at Khan Lee. Um, from Turkey, PhD student, Sinem, who was also getting to grips with having to do online tutoring for her, for, uh, for her colleagues. And from, from the USA, Peter, who was normally working in France, but had found himself stuck in California when all flights were cancelled. So how did we, how did we go ahead? So fortunately, my partner Rob, shown in a picture here, is a software engineer, which is very handy because I am a molecular biologist, but I'm not very techy. And he suggested, okay, why don't you do this using Google Docs? It might sound simple to some of you, but I've never used it myself. And it was absolutely brilliant because in real time, we could all edit, add comments, questions, um, answer questions, and also use uh, an online reference manager, PaperPile, which again was brilliant because it didn't matter where we were in the world, what the time zone was. We could just put all of the references from our research into a central Dropbox. Everyone could access them, download them, read them, and then add them to the growing document. So we decided we did, divided the document up into chunks, introduction, middle bit, techy bit at the end, and we all got going. We also used Skype a lot more than I had ever done before in my life, which was zero times. Um, and, and we had regular meetings. Uh, I, because I was a co coordinator, usually I would choose a very nice time for Bath, UK, where I live, at 10 in the morning. But that sometimes meant that Paul Peter got the, the short straw and was, was Skyping with us at 3 a.m. This is just a screenshot of one of our meetings with just a few of the eight participants. And I think we're probably trying to decide if we should give ourselves a, a deadline. So to cut a long story short, we put together all of our research and published our first review, Coronavirus RNA Proofreading, Molecular Basis and Therapeutic Targeting. And largely due to the, the ambition and determination of Billy, who was uh, our requester, who would not take no for an answer and wanted this review to, to make it into one of the top journals as high as possible. We managed to publish this last September in Molecular Cell, which has got a really high impact factor. Um, and as of today, we have Google Scholar citations up to 99. And as you can see from the matrix, there was a lot of interest on social media something like um, over 140,000 um, shares, likes, and, and comments so far. So there were quite a few of us, and it became clear while we were writing the review that we actually had enough material for two reviews. And so we ended up publishing a second review, which just came out last month, again, in a very high journal, thanks to the determination of Billy, 
uh, trends in biochemical sciences and we, we published our review called nucleic acid based technologies targeting coronaviruses things like antisense oligonucleotides small interfering rnas crispr technology and of course something very current messenger rna vaccines so this has only been out for officially just over a month a uh, very high impact factor. We've already got a few citations and again, a lot of interest uh, and shares on social media. Also, we were really fortunate in making the front cover of Trends in Biochemical Sciences last month. Um, that's because a friend of Palmer, uh, an artist called Luigi Russo, put together this beautiful painting entitled Messenger RNA COVID-19 Vaccine. And it shows a robot unlocking the key to messenger RNA vaccines and handing it to a medic at the front line. So obviously all of this has been personally very satisfying for our CVs and hopefully, especially for the younger um, researchers involved, the PhD students, great for their career. But the reason we obviously got involved was so that we could hopefully make a difference to the pandemic. And hopefully these two reviews will help people to navigate the frankly vast body of literature that's out there, both historic literature and current literature. And hopefully that will point them in the right direction to making some more breakthroughs. Finally, um, if I can just show you the graphical abstract from our first review, showing the proofreading mechanism in action of coronaviruses, this task has also resulted in a collaboration, which probably would never have happened if it weren't for COVID-19, if it weren't for COVID-19, if it in particular, if it weren't for crowdfunding. So mm -hmm. this lab in uh, in Hong Kong and Palmer's lab in Marseille, in France, uh, the Cancer Research Institute there, and are collaborating going forwards. And I just had it from Palmer today that she's just designed and sent some antisense oligonucleotides to Billy's lab uh, in Hong Kong to test in his system. So that's really good news. And thank you to the coordinators and for everyone for asking me to, to join you to speak today and thanks for your attention. So I hope you were able to listen even if it was, uh, I tried to to put it louder, but I couldn't. So, as as you saw, um, our platform worked very well um, in with tasks related to to COVID nineteen. So, 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 um, so our experience was very positive with COVID nineteen. So we decided we wanted to expand our platform uh, to different research topics. So not just COVID nineteen, but to all the scientists. So that's why at the beginning of the year, um, we open our platform to request from, from all kinds of research. That's why you see a little change of our, of our logo. Um, and now we get a lot of different uh, requests. Like for example, we get people wanting help um, analyzing their, their, their data. Um, and we also got a lot of people asking for long-term uh, collaboration. So for example, people wanting to, to write a new project, but they don't have all the expertise, so they need help from, some, from someone else. So now we are trying to, to work more on that, on that sense. And now I will leave Alfonso <laughs> to continue with, uh, with our talk. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and Alfonso. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I will share my screen. Um, will I? Okay. Okay. So, um, so Anna, I think, has told you basically everything you need to know about CrowdFight. Um, the rest is going to be a bit more philosophical. Um, and I would like to, right, basically I would like to share with you the insights or the way we feel in 
crowdfunding score team about the whole thing. Um, and I would like to start <clears throat> explaining a bit why we think that crowdfunding COVID-19 worked at the beginning. And actually this is a very, very personal point of view, uh, but for me, and I think for the other people involved, it's been one of the most interesting experiences in our lives. Um, the fact that crowdfunding exploded and all the work that we needed to do also that was very different to what we were used. Um, I personally learned a lot and I would like to share what I think I learned. So when we started, we did not think, as Anna said, we did not think it would work. We started because it was just dedicating one day to put up a web and see what happened. Uh, but we thought first that many people were probably having the same idea that we were not the right people to do this. We had no expertise in molecular biology or virology or any of the disciplines that can be useful for coronavirus. And we were not ready. So when we started, we were basically three people and three computers. That's what, what we were. Um, however, it was also uh, with a lot of uh, chance involved, um, very successful, it exploded very fast. And uh, we also had contact with other people who were trying uh, similar things. And okay, so first one thing that um, we realized is that when you think that you have an idea that many people must be having, that's not true. In the end, things are very successful or not for little details that you would not be able to anticipate. And even though many platforms were, um, were starting at the, same, at the same time, in retrospect, uh, I think we realized that there were some details in how crowdfunding world was designed that resonated a lot with people and that made it work um, very, very well. And it was worth, I think, that many people, many different people were starting different, slightly different platforms because it's by chance that you hit the right combination. Um, also, something, so it's completely true that we were not the right people for the job, but I think it was good that we focused on what we thought people would need and not we, what we could provide. I think um, the fact that we said, okay, even though, so for example, this figure of the coordinator that we emphasize a lot, we said, there will be someone who really understands your request so that you don't need to explain a lot. You just tell us what you need and then immediately. So some requests are super technical. They, they are full of occurrence, uh, but someone will understand. Even though we did not quite know how to find this person, uh, we said, okay, this person will be needed. So we focused on what people needed. Um, and I think this was also key that even though at the beginning we were not able to, to do everything, um, we did not let that influence the design of, of, the, of the platform. And finally, uh, which has been the most surprising for me, um, I think the fact that we were not ready was helpful because um, what happened was we, at the beginning we had a web page saying we did this, we do all these things, so we will find a magnificent expert for you. Um, even though we were, I mean, we had the idea, we had more or less the methodology in mind, but we were actually, we were so not ready that, uh, I think 48 hours after starting the platform, we had to close it uh, for another 48 hours to reorganize and, and, and everything. Um, but the thing is that the hard part is to know whether what you are offering is useful, right? Whether people will need it. And actually, once you find that people need it, you also get, well, at least in our case, we got a lot of people wanting to help offering, um, uh, offering resources. And actually, it was, the relatively easy part, relatively, is to more or less put it in place, make it work after you have identified the need. And most importantly, what we thought crowdfight would be when it was in our mind is very different to what it became. Uh, people actually did not do exactly what we thought. So if we had built everything at the beginning and then we had started, we would have failed. Uh, it was very useful that actually nothing was there so we could um, adapt very quickly to what people was actually needed, the people, uh, the, the way people wanted to work and so on and so forth. Okay, so in short, what we had 
by chance was the right formula at the right time. I think we had an idea that resonated very well with many people and that turned out to work very well. In great part, because we were at a very special moment in human history. Uh, everyone was in lockdown, everyone was willing to help. Many, many scientists was, were with our mindset. And actually at the beginning, uh, what we actually in our frequent, frequently asked questions, one was, isn't this super inefficient having maybe a top scientist um, transcribing data for, for another scientist? And then the answer was yes, but given that we all want to contribute, uh, then in this emergency situation, it made sense. But we thought that as soon as the pandemic died, crowdfight would also die because it was a scheme that would only work in emergency situations. But then we had two surprises uh, in the way that crowdfight was working. The first one was that this represents what we expected for requests. So we expected that most requests would be something very boring, very mechanical, like transcribe laboratory data, or do an internet search that is very laborious or things like that. But we did not get almost any of these requests. Most of the requests were for very, very specialized help. So I'm trying to set up a new protocol and I need someone who knows this protocol already very well and helps me through it. Or I need someone, a bioinformatician who knows this particular calculation to do it for me. And then this kind of request, they are very, very efficient. So sometimes a volunteer with a Skype conversation of half an hour can save three weeks of trial and error to a research. So it's something that would make sense even in uh, normal situations. The second surprise was that we expected the researchers, the requesters to be very happy because we were helping uh, them with the project. They were in general very happy, but we also found that the volunteers were even happier than the request. Um, and this was also a surprise. So on the one hand, they were happy because they could contribute to, uh, to the research on coronavirus. But actually, the strongest effect, effect was different. The strongest effect was that most volunteers are scientists. Um, and some of you may be scientists and know what I'm talking about. For those who aren't, being a scientist is I don't want to say any bad word, but it's very hard, okay? So you spend all day basically failing, um, trying things that don't work. And the things that you have some skills that everyone in your field has, and you are trying to make progress and you don't make progress. But then suddenly you take this skill that in your field is very common and you take it to some other field, to some other researcher who doesn't have it. And you make a huge difference, right? So the protocol that for you is daily work for somebody else, changes the project. And then you really feel that you are making a difference, that you're helping advance science. Um, and that's a great feeling. Um, so really, the people who were helping were very happy and very incentivized to, to help, even if it's for regular science, if, even if it's not a, a pandemic or an emergency. So because of this, we said, OK, we think this can work in general, not only in the pandemic. Um, and we find that there are well, four ingredients that can make it work in general. The first two is the ones I have mentioned. The requests add a lot of value. And because they add a lot of value, people are very happy uh, to help our incentivize. Also, we found that it's a great way to make contacts. Um, so as Anna said, we focus on things that initially are quick, sharing a protocol or whatever. But in many, many cases, in about 50%, actually, they end up in a long-term collaboration. As in the case we show, they end up publishing a paper together. So it uh, helps both sides. But even for the quick ones, um, so I don't know in your professions, in science, I'm sick of people telling me that I need to network and I need to make contacts. Um, also, I'm a bit shy and for me it's particularly stressing, but um, I find that this way of making contacts is much more agreeable because you are put in contact with the scientists, immediately you are talking about a concrete project, a concrete pro problem where you can help. Um, and then even if it's quick, in the end, you have made a friend, um, usually of a different field that maybe in the future will be a, a useful contact. To me, that's much better than going to a conference and then in the coffee break, talking about the weather and, ta -ta -ta and trying to make it. Um, okay, and the last ingredient. So in science, 
actually we are very used to donating our time. We have something which is called peer review, in which from time to time, uh, you get a request to review somebody else's paper. And then you review it for free, um, and then you give your opinion. But actually what happens is that this is part of our work. Everyone accepts it. We put it in our CV. I reviewed this many papers this year. Um, this time donation, we always do it to control each other. We review our papers, we review our grants. Uh, rarely or never, um, well, so only with close friends to help each other. So we really think there is an opportunity to just change this culture a little bit and say, okay, from time to time, you're gonna get a request to just help another researcher. And here I would like to emphasize the difference between collaborate and help, okay? Collaborate means that two researchers share a project. They both have interest in the same question. Well, help is that one of the researchers does not have interest in the question. He's just helping. I'm gonna be a bit nerdy here um, because I work on evolutionary biology and social behavior. In social behavior, there are two types of cooperation. What we call direct reciprocity, which would be the collaboration where both individuals get something out of the collaboration. And what we call indirect reciprocity, where one individual does something for the other. And if you look at the interaction, it looks completely altruistic. When you think a little bit more, usually there is what we call indirect reciprocity. So maybe in the future, someone else will help the helper. The thing is that animal societies and human society would not work without the two. Uh, you need direct reciprocity, but also you need indirect reciprocity for things to work. And I think in science, we are too much in the direct reciprocity side. We talk a lot about collaborations, but we don't have in our culture the idea of even asking for help. This is something which is weird for us. And I think that if we had this system of helping each other from time to time, we would create an environment where not only it would be much more efficient because you could get a lot of help, exactly help you need, exactly when you need it. But I think it also would make our lives much better. It would be much less lonely um, and, and much more agreeable to, to do science. Okay, so this is why we decided to expand. Now we accept requests from every field and we are trying to reach everyone. Um, and we have important challenges. So the way it's working is the following. Um, we have, so we have our pool of volunteers. Um, some of the volunteers were only interested in, in helping with COVID, but many of them have actually switched to the new platform and they were very happy to help with any, any topic. So actually the side of having volunteers willing to help is working very well. We have enough people who are motivated. The side which is proving harder is to get requests. We are getting requests, but much fewer than we would like, especially because um, the, for the system to be efficient, we have our central administration, which takes time to process the request and so on and so forth. For this to be really efficient, we need a high volume of requests. And then, um, so two things might be happening. One might be that actually it's not so useful. Uh, people are afraid that we, you need to talk to someone else to da da da. Um, so maybe the service is not as useful as we thought. Actually, we don't think this is the case. I mean, there are many things to prove and we are trying to improve them, but we have people who repeat requests. So we have some people who have made two, three, five requests. So. Some people who are using the, the system actually find it very useful. Um, on the other hand, we have, so a problem of reaching people. We have very limited budget. Um, as uh, Mersa said, we are a nonprofit. Most of the people or almost everyone in the, in the team, we are volunteers. We, we had a project and we could hire one person for, for some time, but it's basically volunteer work and we have very limited budget. So we, are, um, we don't have a lot of money for publicity. Also, we find that explaining what we do is not trivial. Uh, just because scientists are not used to having this type of help, it takes more than a tweet to explain what we do. And nowadays, this is a big problem. Uh, so we also need to, I think, on the one hand, perhaps uh, refine the message, but maybe we were even discussing that maybe we need even to slightly change what we do so that it's easier to explain. Um, Okay, another challenge, which we didn't mention, um, 
So as I said, volunteers are happy and incentivized as it is, but we may want to make it even uh, more attractive. And the way to do this is to document every interaction. So uh, we want the interactions through CrowdFight to be something that people can put in their CV. Even if it's not a big deal, it's something that counts a little bit. And for that, we need to document everything. So uh, we are preparing a personal profile that every volunteer will have with the list of everything they did uh, for CrowdFight. And that requires that every little interaction, even if it's very quick, is documented in a standard format. Um, so we are trying, so that's easy when you have to document five uh, interactions, but to do it automatically on a scale, that's a hard. So we're also working hard on that. Because then the real challenge is to scale up, um, to make this general and, and amazing. Um, Okay, so if you want to contribute to CrowdFight in any way, there are many ways in which you can. You can sign up as a CrowdFight volunteer. That's for everyone. So you don't need to be a scientist, okay, to, to, be, uh, to participate in CrowdFight. You just go to CrowdFight.org. Um, it's very easy. You fill a form with your expertise. And then what will happen is that about once a month, okay, we are not very intrusive, uh, you get an email saying, hey, we have this request. There is a description. Do you think you can help? Very often you cannot help. You just say, ah, I, this is not my expertise because we, we cannot target perfectly. Uh, but if you can help and we decide that everything can work, we put you in contact with the request. If you are a scientist, you can make a request. If, you, if there is any expertise that you need, you can uh, make a request. As I said, visibility is a problem. So you can tell everyone about us. Um, if you are organizing a conference or you have a seminar series in your department or anything, we are very happy to give a talk. It doesn't need to be as long as today. We can talk for two minutes and tell people what CrowdFight is. Um, as long as it's longer than a tweet, we are for it. Um, you can make a donation also with crowdfight.org. Um, actually, you can also buy a merchandising. We have mugs with our logo and stickers, and we are going to have more things. So if you want to um, drink coffee, we are your people. Um, and also, as I said, we are evolving. We are very open to ideas, to, to feedback. So, um, of course, today we will be very happy to get the feedback, but also you can write us to this uh, email address, contact at CrowdFight, or through our Twitter handle, or in any other way. And we are uh, very open to ideas and comments and feedback. And I think that's all. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. And I want to emphasize that. So there are many people, these in the photos are the people in the core team at CrowdFight. But also there are many people who are doing uh, the work as coordinators, scientific advisors, and of course, uh, all the members who are donating their time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Anna and Alfonso. That was very insightful. And actually on the topic that you just mentioned, uh, there was a question in our chat from Jan. Um, so I will read it out loud for you. Um, have you documented the tools and workflows you guys use and how did this evolve as more questions and volunteers came in? There are some requesters and volunteers easy to work with and how are people screened? So that's the question. So, um, okay, maybe I can take the first question um, and then maybe I can let Anna or Alberto because, okay, so the first question uh, is my fault. Um, we have, so, I mean, we have documented something, um, but actually our pipeline is an absolute mess. Um, it's been hack after hack after hack. Um, and so, and actually this is a bit of a shame because something very important of what we have built is a method. Uh, this methodology in which we process requests, we have been refining it. Um, we have like a lot of PowerPoints. Uh, Alberto was very involved in this, designing all the, the workflow. Um, and it's very poorly documented. We have some internal documentation to train the people, but, um, but it's poor. And actually the technology, so the actual code that is running the platform is embarrassingly uh, crappy. And this is something that we are also trying to improve as we go. Um, and maybe, yeah, and Alberto can answer. So uh, the platform evolved a lot since the first day. Um, at 
Alfonso said at the beginning, uh, was, I was not involved since the very first day, but at the beginning they were getting lots, lots of requests and everything was working only like in an Excel file. <laughs> so when we were getting uh, tens of requests a day, we had to, um, some things were not automatic, so we had to automatize that kind of stuff. Um, then, uh, if some requests or volunteers are easy, there are a lot of different kinds of people. Um, I wouldn't say we have uh, found like people that are hard to work with, but sometimes we have uh, requesters and volunteers that respond very, very fast and, and it's easy to interact with them. And sometimes we have uh, requesters that make a request then they we put them in contact with someone and that's all uh, so they are, it's a very short interaction with us uh, but as Alfonso also said we also have some uh, request requesters that have done a lot of requests that so and now we are we even know them like they we have interacted so many times that now uh, we 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 know them and we have talked and everything um, and how are people screened? Um, when we get a request, um, the first, we, we make different kinds of screen. Like at first there is the reception. So we get the request and there is a person, myself, <laughs> that sees if the request makes sense because of time we receive like uh, requests that are don't, don't make sense at all. <laughs> that don't come from a, a scientist, but from a random person. Sometimes we get requests that are just people trying to volunteer. Um, then when it's a valid request, we send that to all the volunteers. Then the volunteers can say like, I can help with this and I can help with that. Um, so then what we call a scientific advisor. So it's, we have experts in different kinds of fields um they get like all the answers from the volunteers and they can go like volunteer by volunteer and see who seems the more um the more per like they try to find the perfect match um so that's how people are screened there is a person a scientific expert uh behind everything that choose the volunteers and then uh the selected volunteers are put in contact with the with the with the requester. Um, I got also another uh, question about how. Can I, Anna, please? Uh, yes. Let, add, let, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I would like to add a, a little bit more about this. Well, first of all, I would like to apologize because for some reason, I was not uh, receiving the alert in the chat. So I didn't know that you were guys asking. I'm sorry because I was supposed That's to. That's okay. Answer. No problem. No problem, Albert. No problem. Uh, for Tony, there were not many questions. So uh, I would like to add a little bit about this this thing uh, on on how we check uh, our volunteers and also the requests themselves. Uh, because I, I think it's interesting, perhaps for you that are uh, data scientists, because it's one of the open questions we have to scale up our, our uh, platform. I think that one of our strengths is precisely that we are doing many steps uh, manually, meaning that uh, there is an expert having a look at the request. There is an expert deciding if the volunteer suggestions to look for someone because some, sometimes the volunteer himself or herself is not the person that is appropriate to solve the request, but they suggest someone else. Uh, for doing that. So we have experts that go to the websites, check whether they they do this and the, uh, this person is actually an expert and so on and so forth. So this is a lot of work. And this of course would be a problem if we want to scale this up uh, to a large volume, right? So for now we are uh, enough people and do not have a, well, we, we had actually problems in the beginning with COVID-19, that was really, a lot of work and and it was everything volunteer and and honestly i think we could we would not be able to to keep this uh, project moving with that volume 
unless there is a huge amount of people joining us. So I, we think that it is also interesting from a data scientist point of view, or if you want a machine learning point of view, how our workflow could at least be partially uh, automatized in some of these steps. So this is something to, to think about beyond the, the fact that, of course, data scientists are very welcome uh, to join as volunteers because there are always uh, requests in, in that sense. But also, as an organization, I think it's uh, for us, it would be of help to discuss these kind of things with, with data, data scientists themselves. Yeah. So we should Thank perhaps, uh, unless Andrew was willing to say something, no? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thank you guys so much for, for the talk. Um, there's a lot of mirroring between uh, the stages that Crowdvac went through and that Equilate is going through. So we also have a community of volunteers that um, basically donate their skill set to NGOs that have no clue what data science is. And a lot of the pings that you've seen is uh, the pings that we've seen as well. Um, how do we get to the end client? Um, but yeah, so uh, just to preface this, besides um, uh, being one of the co-founders of Correlate, um, my main domain expertise is search and recommendations within the field of data science. And this sounds exactly like what search and recommendations should do. How do you get from um, a request that um, is rather specific and match that with the skill set of a sub selection of these 45,000 volunteers. Um, so I'd be very interested to uh, keep talking with you and to figure out how your, your targeting works right now and see if there's something that data science that we can do or something very quick and easy, like running an Elasticsearch or whatever behind it. Um, yeah, I think my answer already got, uh, my question already got answered with uh, how do you target and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys have a lot of manual labor. Um, and once you figure out if a request is, is correct enough to send out to a volunteer, you send it out to the entire list of 45,000 volunteers. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And then we have to review as many answers as we receive also manually i mean we have yeah. we have of course we have of course some standards no and some uh, metadata which allow us to filter the and to short uh, these answers no in a way in which it's easier to inspect but uh, in the end since uh, it is about to verify whether a person is an expert or not and we really care about not sending anyone to help these this, uh, scientists uh, in the end, it's unavoidable that that someone has to proof check that that it is uh, this person is an expert. No. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I remember just to note. I remember getting the uh, link to the Google form that you guys had every weekend, and then just going through it and taking it myself. How do they match these things? And now I know you do it manually, so I know <laughs> how that works. Now, thank you, Alberto. <laughs> I actually heard case, that Google. I heard actually heard that Google uh, also does a lot of matching manually, and they call it AI. So um, I don't think a small platform like this has to uh, be ashamed of that. So no, no, no. no. Uh, the case. You also had a, a question or a situation. Uh, maybe you'd like to um, uh, ask them in person. Yes, uh, well, as I wrote down, I just had one specific example that I put in the chat, but um, uh, I have a, a, a more of these um, um, uh, requests coming in. And usually what I try to do is um, make them um, um, uh, uh, that I only mediate if it is, uh, if there's a very uh, interesting scientific aspect to the to request, for instance, with a lot of search um, uh, algorithms, uh, it is known that for uh, different types of searches, you run into uh, um, a number of fundamental problems. And a lot of NGOs actually have that problem. Um, for instance, if you're doing matching, 
uh, on a dating site, you can do it quite fairly easily because the profiles that you make are fairly similar. But with a lot of, uh, for instance, refugees, the requests are mutually so tremendously different that uh, you really get into a fundamental problem. And I also allow, if, if I have volunteers, them to work to publish on that. <clears throat> because I, I have been working with volunteers myself uh, quite a lot. And my, my problem is often is that they have to negotiate their time and their, their other, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the, the other things that they have to do um, with the work that they, they do. And so I do really try to create an incentive for that. But um, on the other hand, especially if you're working for a specific group, there is also just work that needs to be done, which is not scientifically in interesting, but just, you know, making the miles. And so um, I was wondering if, if, if um, these kind of requests fit in the profile of, of crowd fights or not. Yeah, I think you were mentioning, for instance, a user experience expert, no? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, we had we had in the past this this kind of request, and we often had the volunteers for that. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's a matter of uh, you know also the moment, no? Uh, with COVID, everyone was willing to to help, but I think there are certain sensitive moments also. For instance, now. Uh, with all what is happening in Afghanistan, I think it's a good moment as well, not to ask for help for uh, refugees uh, and so on. Yes, exactly. Actually, uh, I can I can perhaps uh, show you tell you actually my, my experience because my own experience because uh, we had the requests from uh, one NGO, the Pax Syriana Foundation. Uh, that they were willing to know how they could reorganize uh, refugee camps uh, in a way in which they could minimize the spread of the virus. So we, uh, we launched this uh, request in which I was involved myself as a modeler. And we found not just modelers, but also people willing to help into writing a policy report people willing to help in building a website. And now we have a very beautiful project, I think, in which we have a, the policy report, the press release, a scientific paper, and all that was was uh, through, thanks to CrowdFight. Mm, yes. So mm -hmm. I think that at least uh, definitely we, we, could, we could try to find people. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Yeah, so maybe to elaborate a little bit, even though we are focused on scientists, um, our only red line so far is that we don't work for private companies, uh, but NGOs uh, are perfectly fine with us. We, yeah, we're, I mean, we're still refining a bit about policies, but, um, but that's it. So we are very happy to help in those cases. And actually, um, if you see in Correlate um, that you, we can help each other in any way, uh, we are very open to starting partnership, we have partnership with different organizations that uh, help in different ways. So we could uh, try to find volunteers for your cases or, or whatever, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sure. There's um, maybe another thing that I've um, run into um, and which um, probably might also be interesting as, as a, um, a way to, to, um, to proceed is um, what I often see is that I have a lot of problems getting funding for these projects, um, especially if I do it through the company and maybe it's a very Dutch thing, but the Dutch like to compartmentalize everything. And so if you have a, a request that does not fit the, um, well, let's say the, 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 the topics, the categories and the ideas, then um, suddenly you notice that um, uh, um, you get into this fuzzy world where you basically are always proposing um, uh, um, um, something that, that nobody finds interesting, while uh, especially if it's, for instance, on refugees, I think it's really, really, really important. And so um, I often 
I, I think I am quite good in always seeing that the scientific challenge that I can put into it. So with, with, with volunteers that they can um, publish on, but I could imagine that you also may have, um, may uh, mediate in, um, in, in, in um, uh, um, translating the assignments in such a way that they, they become fundable for um, uh, within, um, within a research uh, grant proposal, for instance. And I think that a lot of you do have a lot of experience in writing research proposals. So I do think that is another um, talent that you could bring in for, um, uh, for this initiative. Yeah, um, in fact, some of the requests are people who are explicitly saying, I want to apply for a project, I need someone with, uh, with this or that expertise. To apply together to a project. Yeah. So that's also something, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I have a whole list of questions, but I just want to give a chance to the audience. And I think, Maria, you have some more questions maybe in the list? Or? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I can try with one of mine. <laughs> Sure, sure. So I was actually, it was very inspiring to listen to all those stories of collaboration, but I was wondering if there is like one story that uh, really impressed you a lot or you remembered a lot, maybe not even in science, well, not very scientific related, but what happened with crowd, within Crowdfight that uh, actually uh, made you think that, uh, well, made you remember this. Yeah. I have quite a few actually yeah. <laughs> of them. So one is this one. No, I, I talk about about the Syrian uh, modeling because it, it was quite interesting because we got directly in touch with the Syrian opposition leaders. Uh, that uh, it was very very interesting uh, conversations in Arabic translated simultaneously in a very tough situation, which was my first experience of this kind uh, as a scientist. Uh, then I can remember, for instance, one uh, South African company that was developing antibodies uh, from alpaca. Uh, and they were requiring a high safety laboratory, which is, there are very few in the world, actually, in, able to, in, in order to try to see whether they, this, uh, their antibodies they were developing were working in with with the virus and we found a laboratory in glasgow uh, willing to to do this these tests which i think it would have never happened no to connect the south african people with people in scotland uh, and this is now uh, they are now preparing a publication and a patent as well and another one I like, for instance, is uh, one request from Uganda. They got um, a PCR uh, machine to, to, to perform uh, high throughput uh, PCRs, but they, were, they didn't know how to use it. So basically they were asking for help to, to use this machine. And yeah, we found people willing to, to help them in, in, in using the machine. Yeah, I don't know if you guys remember some more examples. I had in mind exactly the last one you, you talked about. I, it, it, that was the one I had, uh, I had in mind, the one where they needed help with the, with the machine. There was also one, an interesting one, that it was a... Um, Someone wanted to translate a survey to track coronavirus to many, many languages. And we did like a massive thing, um, a bit self-organized. So we set documents where we sent it to thousands of volunteers. And then we said, you go to the document where you can contribute and you do it yourself. And then um, we thought it would be a mess, but actually it was amazing. Um, first, so we have a system to send the massive emails and it takes like a few minutes from you click until the last email is sent. And then we go back and check that. And in that case, we sent the thing to already with the document. Um, it was maybe to 2000 volunteers uh, that were already presented. Before the last email was sent, uh, some of the translations were already finished. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. 
And also it was super nice to see. So they had a document and places to comment how thorough people were. Uh, they didn't know each other, but they were, oh, I would change this word to that time. Very polite, everyone commenting and, and feeling there. So that was really, really nice to see. Those are very nice examples. Thank you for sharing. And they're very different. Like, I'm not from scientific world. So for me, yeah, it's not that mostly it's related to research, but it's also a lot of actually practical things that could, that uh, someone can help with. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I, uh, maybe we can see if audience has more questions. Maybe anybody? Yeah. I, I would have one question too. Uh, um, Sure. Alfonso, uh, first of all, thank you for this very nice meditation on this uh, great year and a half or so you had, uh, and and also your meditations on science and and how that could change. I, I'm especially interested. You said that we do not, or scientists don't really have a culture of um, helping each other. Only you know you have a close friend or collaborator that, that you help, and and helping is not collaborating. So for collaborating, you, you you know you you would be on the paper, for example, or at least in your acknowledgments or so. Um, and um, and you, you talked about that you know th there should be this norm shift in in the scientific community and, and and you mentioned this peer review but but you know every like if I talk to people they don't really like to peer review right they certainly don't like to get the reviews um, some 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 curious how do you think we can achieve or science can achieve this norm shift of uh, more helping rather than uh, collaborating or wanting something in exchange. Great question. I don't have a definite answer. Um, so I think that um, I honestly think that the incentives are already there. I, I think people, from our experience, people enjoy the interactions a lot um, for, at a personal level. In the case of peer review, we all complain about peer review, but in the end, it's voluntary and we do it anyway. We could reject every everyone right so there is a bit of a component of it looks good on the cv even though it doesn't count a lot that's why we think it's important that we document everything and that people can put in the cv the, the interactions i think for it to work in general it needs to be to become a standard just like peer review is a standard this should become a standard um but also honestly it's fun because it's something that you do easily you help a lot someone you make the connection I mean, really, there are a lot of, uh, of incentives that are already there. Uh, because as I say, what we see is that people are very happy at the end of interaction. I think the, um, we also think that we could use a further incentive, which is preferential access, right? So if you help, then you get help more easily mm -hmm. uh, because there is clearly here a, a component that we could use. We are not needing to use it so far because people are happy to help, but we could incorporate it. Um, so actually, I think it's, yeah, it's mostly that we realize that this is possible. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, I mean, this is something that I think also the pandemic has helped because mm -hmm. we have all got used to Zoom. Suddenly, we are very used to working remotely. Um, and before, it was not possible, right? Finding someone with the right skills that are close enough, we were not used to this. But now that, that we are used to working remotely, um, I think it's the time. To, to change this. And I think, yeah, as I say, I think, I think the incentives are there. It's just to tell people, hey, you can just ask for help. And yeah. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, I, I think also the, the pandemic in some sense induced a, a sense of renewed altruism in a sense. Like everybody was like, okay, how can I, how can I help? Um, um, another thing you, you, you mentioned is that, and, and we have the same in, in Correlate that we have, you know, orders of magnitudes more volunteers than, than requests. Yes. Um, do you think, yeah, like, what, yeah, what do you think should be done there? Or how can that be more incentivized? I just make a small comment about that. I realized that um, in my lab, um, I interact a lot with, um, with postdocs, and, and PhD students. And I have usually like someone making a comment like, oh, I would like to talk with an expert about this. And my answer is always go to Crowdfire, we can help you. <laughs> but they are often, no, but my project is not, 
is not advanced enough so i don't want to talk with someone like that i don't know and i'm always like we don't care like it, yeah. it's okay if, if even if you're beginning your project you can ask for help and even if you don't continue your project it's okay if you're trying just to to begin so i realized that people have at least my friends my postdocs friends they have that that problem mm -hmm. and i haven't i i don't know how to convince them that they can make a request but it happens to me a lot to mm -hmm. hear comments like i would like help with this and come to crowdfight and then mm -hmm. no i can so i don't know what what's going alfonso what he wants to say no i mean to me there are two things so the social awareness, uh, also because oh, my project is not advanced enough, that's, that's uh, an important thing. And also, I would say management skills. Um, so for example, the, the example, the video that Anna showed, that's been a tremendously successful request, also because the requester is amazing. He, he organized the group, he, he had a very clear idea, he, right? And I think people lack these management skills. And by people, mm -hmm. I also mean us. So for example, we, I mean, we had thousands of volunteers uh, and we, we, we had thousands of things to do and we couldn't organize them, right? It's very hard to organize. So, I mean, I don't have the answer, but if we manage to give structure to, to this, right? Not only tell the NGOs or the scientists, ask for help. Mm. And right, but somehow facilitate the management and mm. like cut in small pieces and make it even easier to think about how to ask for help. I think that's one of the key key aspects. Um, I don't know how to do it, but yeah. 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 yeah, just to add to this, I think that we could ask the opposite question, no? Which is why some uh, projects work so well, and. For this, and coming back again on to the previous question no, about science, science is now extremely competitive and people do not want to invest time on anything different than publishing because it's the only thing that it counts for your future, right? So, and, and the answer to this is like, if we would have been having credit for every single step that we do in science, people would be willing to do other stuff like peer review. Now we are giving our time for journals that earn a lot of money for nothing, right? Because neither our name will appear in the paper. And so I think that this is a very important thing, the visibility of the, our contributions. And in that respect, the model that I really like is, one, uh, is the one of uh, Stack Overflow, or Stack Exchange, all these uh, platform, right? Because what they are doing is in a way, it's sad to say that, but it's they are promoting ego in a way, right? They are really uh, showing people the, the, that the people that helps is really promoted in the community. And, but also the people that ask good questions are promoted in the community. And all this is just the small interface they have for each user to get credit with points, with, uh, with uh, this, this different... Uh, qualities that you are, you get when you answer a good question or you are someone that has answer very old questions, these kind of things. No, it, I think it's a very simple idea and it's extremely successful. And this is one of the things that actually we are considering, no? like be civilizing more our volunteers, no? uh, giving them a profile in which we can monitor all the activity that they are doing for us, even just reading uh, our requests and answering from time to time should have uh, some credit for that. Thank, thank you, Albert. Thank you for mentioning that. I mean, just to add on that one, I've been working with science scientists uh, many years and the last two years, every time what it came back was publish and perish problem. Publish or perish. There's always a problem there. But what I wanted to add to this question was maybe a different angle of it is I think what is maybe a little bit missing in the scientific world is the user experience. And I think it is a mindset. It is a mindset of why people request are much less than offers. People want to help, but they don't want to ask because they feel shy or there's something else. 
And I want just to ask your opinion, uh, uh, what do you think about the user experience and how that user experience, whether it is a digital platform, whether it is the way that we work together, the user experience could change in a way that would make it much more easier for people. There would be no barriers. How would we, how could we actually have a user experience in our scientific platforms that will help people to get rid of the old mentality and come with a mindset that makes it easy for them and very transparent for them to go over the barrier and work together. Instead of thinking of, no, maybe I should stop. Maybe this is not, a, I shouldn't ask. So I just want to see what, what you think about that. So I, I like very much the um, comparison with user experience because I agree that just like in user experience, tiny details can make a, a huge difference. Um, but the, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a question of social architecture or social engineering to make this um, happen. And I, I don't have any concrete. I know, um, me too. Yeah. I don't either. Yeah, but it's it's a. I think it's something that we maybe the scientific world could take a look at, and then see if they can bring in the experts in user experience into the community, and then see if they can change the way people the, the people work and people think about how they interact, whether it is a true digital platform or whether it is about asking, and requesting, and offering. There's one thing that I know is that user experience is an art form and um, it is uh, very good to get people on board who know uh, how, who know about that. I think we techies do have a bit of a kind of um, uh, a tendency to think that we can do everything ourselves, but it's very good to know when you should not do something yourself and get help. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Uh, I, um, I'd like to add something on that. Um, I'm, I'm not a postdoc or anything. I'm actually an undergraduate. But being exposed to this kind of thinking even before I start doing my own research actually is very useful. Um, it already puts me in that state of mind that, oh, if I have a project, I can ask help there. And so also promoting this to people who haven't started their academic uh, careers yet, who aren't set in the in the in the, the publisher parish mentality as Jan j just uh, shared in the, in the chat is important as well. Before the norm is set to um, advertise this. Thank you. Oh, and thank you for the talks. I'm very much inspired. Thank you very much. And thank you for the comment. I totally agree. You are our hope. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I think we, I, I think you are totally right. Um, it's the younger people who can really change the mindset. Um, and and I, I, I think you are right that we should make our communication emphasis probably at that level um, and be patient. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, on the publisher parish thing, uh, my two cents as I uh, entered uh, academia at a quite late age, and even though my PhD research was received very well, um, when I went for a postdoc, I was told that I had too little publications on my uh, um, repertoire to either e to even consider furthering my career. And ever since I have just taken my own pet projects, I know how to, um, to uh, publish. So every time I feel that I have something to share with the community, I will write an article. But that is such a different mindset than always trying to get 10 or 15 publications with 20 co-authors um, uh, uh, written down every year. And it gives a very relaxed kind of attitude. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I have a lot of questions, but uh, I think we are running out of time. So. <laughs> Uh, maybe a last question from the audience. Or so I, I see there are a couple in the chat. Yes. Um, sure. Although, well, I could write, but yeah, because so there's one whether we um, looked at other uh, question answer platforms. Um, so I, and I like to because there are things like there's one page called ResearchGate, uh, which is 
it has a forum, there's a stack overflow. Um, and I, so the thing is, we are complementary to all this. There are many things where a forum or a stack overflow is the right way to go. Um, and that's maybe, I don't know, well, a percentage. Um, what we are, so as Alberto said, our distinguishing factor is the person in the middle. And we, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't improve a lot our machine learning algorithm to automate as much as we can. Um, but I think in the end, the distinguishing thing is that part of the thing is a person looking at it, making a selection and sending a high quality match uh, to, the, to the person. And that's, I think that's the distinguishing uh, feature with other platforms. And also what makes it harder to scale. That's also a challenge. Uh, Alfonso, is that referring as a question? Uh, did you research other open source questions or answer question answer platforms? Is that the yeah? yeah that's what I what yeah. I was. Thank you. Thank yeah. Excellent. Uh, maybe one last final question. Anyone? Otherwise, I have a question. All right, I have a question for for Crowdfire. I just wanted to see how you see your platform develop in the coming two to three years. Because I think this is not the last pandemic that we will have. There will be more coming, scientifically proven. Uh, and there will be more challenges, uh, all type of crisis, humanistic crisis. How do you see the platform develop in the coming two, three years? And what is your vision for it? If you could share that with us, that would be great. I can go. So, um, so we have some things that are more or less clear, some things that are not. And for example, this is something we were just yesterday discussing, um, whether our mission should be the one I have explained today, I think, which is scientific collaboration in general, or we should focus more on maybe what you more uh, appealed, which is clarified climate change. So focus on specific topics. They are not excluding. Um, so we, we can do both at the same time. Uh, but it's, still, it's a bit of a decision, mostly from the communication point of view. Um, so I think our vision for two years would be ideally right, um, to have a stable platform that is efficient in what we do so that people make a request and then in a few days uh, the match is made it is effective so we something which is very important for us we monitor whether things are successful in the end we send a survey to the request and we ask hey did it really help did it really make a difference so um, our dream is to have a high success rate um, at the end and a, and a fast turnover and in two years, I wouldn't ask more than we have some stability and we have um, some request rate, which is reasonable. But in two years, I wouldn't expect being uh, like well known by every scientist in the world. But in 10 years, that's <laughs> where actually, so, and, and I, I want to be, um, because this you can check, okay? Maybe it won't be crowd fight. What we want is that in 10 years, this culture shift, shift has happened. Maybe, maybe it won't be us, but, uh, that we have contributed to, there is some way in which we can ask for help more, more effectively. I think that would be, and that this is a standard. This is the dream that just like everyone knows peer review, that uh, it is something that once a year, every scientist asks for help or gives help. Excellent. Thank you. I'm rooting for that. I'm rooting for you guys. Excellent. Uh, Anna, if uh, maybe you would like to add some, your vision? Uh, I was thinking about a very personal vision <laughs> because I am, um, I still have, I am doing, I am a PhD student. So I still have like one year and a half. And I know that I don't want to continue doing a postdoc but I would like to continue uh, working in science and in this kind of, of platform. So when you ask the question, I was thinking to myself, I hope Crowdfight is stable enough 
So I can continue working on something like that after my PhD. That's what I was thinking about, very thinking about myself. Excellent. Rooting for you as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Alberto? Yeah, I'm following up a little bit on, on Alfonso. No, I think that it would be great if we have, I, I, what I would be willing to see is that we have at least three, four clear lines of crowdfunding, uh, different questions, and that this help us to perhaps promote this, this mindset a little bit farther away with other type of of uh, more general more general requests no but at least myself i think personally to to get momentum i think that we should still work on more on specific questions which is what people get engaged and so on and and then i would be willing to see like a more uh, uh, integrate integrated platform in which uh, our way of doing things and the users are interacting more directly and we can really give credit to them more directly you know a little bit like what is as i said not what happening in 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 stack exchange and this kind of platforms i see and of course uh, having enough stability to professionalize part of it which i think it's uh, really needed perfect perfect thank you thank you uh this has been an amazing talk. I just want to thank you guys for, uh, for the sessions, for the talks. Thank the audience for being here and spending time with us. I just want to tell everybody, please connect. That is our goal and mission, connect people. Collaboration is the culture that is growing and that is also should be what is gonna help the human race to get the next step. So please connect, please collaborate and stay in touch. Thank you, everyone. Alfonso, Anna, Alberto. Thanks a lot for your time. And, Thank you uh, for, you for the having us here. This was great. Thanks a lot. It was very inspiring. Thank you.